really, really cool guest, Martin. Martin Ball, you know, 5-MEO. 5-MEO was my medicine that really, um, really grounded me into this plant medicine path and this experience of who I am and why I'm here. But let me go ahead and introduce Martin, and let him tell a little bit about himself and why he's here and what brought him on this path. Hey, Martin. Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Good, brother. Yeah. Well, I'm here because you invited me. And I am. Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really happy you're here today. You know, this is a cool topic, you know, and 5-MEO for me was my life changer. It, it really said that, you know, it was the third time I did 5-MEO. My first two were kind of just there. That third time I saw that white light, that God, and, you know, really couldn't explain it after. It was no, no, no visuals, no nothing. It was just that light. And it was a beautiful light. And after that, um, you know, took me a little bit of integrating because I, you know, it was kind of fresh, but it was, yeah. it was, it was my experience after a lot of plant medicines experiences. That was, that was one that I will not forget. Yeah. I as well have had many different kinds of plant medicine experiences. And also I've tried out a lot of different synthetic molecules. I'm, I'm pretty much interested in all of them and um, had had, you know, years of experience primarily working with psilocybin mushrooms and salvia divinorum before I first ever encountered 5-MeO DMT and actually got to experience 5-MeO before I got to experience many other things. Um, so it was actually third, kind of third in my list of uh, substances that I was able to encounter, but it came many years into my explorations of altered states of consciousness and psilocybin mushrooms and salvia divinorum. And for me, uh, I was actually first introduced to 5-MeO DMT when in 2006, um, my fifth book uh, became public and it's called Mushroom Wisdom. And that's the only book I have that's been published by a publisher. And many people think it's my first book, but actually it was my fifth that I wrote four novels before that. But anyway, um, when that book came out, I had a person in Southern California who said, hey, I really want your book, but um, I can't afford to buy it. Can I trade you some things for it? So I said, sure. So I sent him a copy of the book. And among the various things that he sent me were some Yopo seeds. And as your listeners may or may not know that Yopo is one of the natural plant sources that contains 5-MeO DMT. And he gave me instructions for how to roast these seeds and how to remove the shell off of them and then crush them and then you snort them. And I tried doing that a few times and I didn't really like the nutty flavor up my nose. And, and so then I also tried just smoking the uh, roasted crushed seeds and it was it was interesting. I mean, I could tell, okay, this is a psychedelic molecule. I'm feeling affected by it. Um, but especially at that time of my life when I was working with kind of high potency salvia divinorum, um, it didn't seem like much in comparison. And then in late 2007, I moved up here to Ashland, Oregon. And very shortly after moving here, I was contacted by someone uh, through a whole interesting series of events that I don't need to get into because there's a lot of details. But anyway, this guy calls me up and he's like, well, do you want to come try some some toad? And and he said, this is a, a rocket ship straight into the heart of God. And at the time he was quoting James Orock. And so I said, sure, you know, I'll come try it. Um, I'm interested. And the first time he invited me over, he had some toad secretions, which is another one of these organic places where we can find 5-MeO DMTs from the secretions of the Sonoran Desert toad. Um, but he only had a very small supply and he wanted to have enough for me to have an experience and for him to have an experience. And so he gave me um, the toad secretions and it was more powerful than the Yopo seeds, but still in comparison to Salvia divinorum, I was kind of like, I don't see what the big deal is. Like, yeah, this was kind of dreamy. There was some energy there, but this wasn't, you know, a rocket ship straight into the heart of God. So anyway, then one month later, he had some pure free base 5-MeO DMT. And he said, okay, I've got the goods now. Come on over and try it again. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story many times. So people probably have seen me doing this online, but um, it had this glass piston vaporizer. So there's this glass chamber and the, he is filled with argon gas so that nothing burns and he's heating up the 5-MeO from beneath and it gets this milky white vapor in this chamber. And there's this piston that comes down as you're taking in the hit. 
-hmm. And as I've recounted many times that the hit got down to about right there. I didn't even take the entire thing. And it was instantly, oh my God, I've done it now. I'm dying. And oh my God, it's God. And this was a revelation for me because, you know, I I have my background in religious studies. I've studied comparative mysticism. I've studied altered states of consciousness. Um, I had a very intellectual academic understanding of Um, Mm non-duality, but this was clearly, it was the most, it was God. It was God. Mm -hmm. That was the best word for it, that this was Mm -hmm. God. This was not some mythological being sitting up on a cloud, but this was this universal consciousness that was made out of the pure energy of absolute unconditional love. And that it was also myself. It wasn't something that was exterior to me that because my ego was completely stripped away and that what was mm-hmm. revealed was like oh my god i i'm it it's me it's always been me and i don't mean that in the personal sense i mean that in the universal sense that when we strip away the ego that that's the identity that's left is that i am this universal consciousness and it's something that we all have inherent access to we just need the right tools in order to be able to have that experience so it was it was a revelatory experience for me completely changed my life completely changed my perspective and i've been working on educating the world about 5meo dmt ever since then and that was in like january of 2008 so i've been working at this for a long time yeah you explained that blast off pretty well you know that's pretty amazing how it is and what do you think what do you think after that experience is brings us to this? What is it about that medicine that almost dissolves that ego? What do you think it is? Well, I like to kind of present it all um, using the language of energy. And I find that this is just a very neutral way of talking about it. That, you know, again, I have my PhD in religious studies, but mm-hmm. I myself, I'm not a religious person. Um, I even actually after these experiences, I disidentified as a spiritual person as well, mm-hmm. because I had been, I constructed my ego as a spiritual seeker. You know, I'm, I'm looking for something. And then once I found what I was looking for, and this was mm-hmm. clearly it, there yeah, no it was it is a seeker mm-hmm. anymore. So I've tried to develop a just a neutral language of energy that doesn't get into spirituality, doesn't get into metaphysics, doesn't doesn't get into religious doctrine and dogma. So what the, the way that I like to describe it is that the human ego itself is just a collection of patterns of energy with which we regulate and kind of create ourselves as a character with different patterns of expression, modes of thought, modes of uh, gesticulation, tone of voice, ways of speaking. And all of these patterns of energy are embodied here in our bodies, you know, in the same way that a friend of yours could see you walking down the street and immediately know that that was you, not just by how you look, but how you're moving. Um, You know, people can do that for me and for other people that we, we, create these characters and it's a way that we express and embody our energy Mm -hmm. but these just are limited patterns of energy and taken all together they form the human ego and we've identified with them so we say well i think things this way i express myself this way um and what happens with 5-meo dmt that doesn't really happen with other entheogenic medicines so i do like to say that Most entheogenic experiences, and I mean the vast majority of them, still reside within the realm of duality. So we take in these psychedelics and they amplify and alter our experience of energy. And so in, in kind of the modern parlance, we would say that they disrupt the default mode network, which is our regular patterns of uh, neurons firing that create the sense of ego and sense of self. So we get a disruption of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we don't get an overriding of that so that most psychedelic experiences are still filtered through the ego in some capacity. But what happens with 5-MeO DMT is that it is so energetically powerful that it presents the opportunity to energetically completely override these more limited patterns of energy of expression and identity that we have with the ego. So it creates this near-death experience but it's, I think it's quite fascinating that it doesn't 
force the experience on anyone, meaning that you can go into this and you can feel like, oh my God, I'm dying. And the ego mm -hmm. can say, oh my God, I'm afraid. I'm going to hold on. And people can hold on and maintain their egoic identity. It doesn't have to override it. But if they choose to, if they choose to release and let go into the experience, then mm -hmm. that personal identity is completely overridden by this infinite expression of energy and what it wow. reveals is that beyond the limited construct of the ego is this universal consciousness where there is no separation between me and not me subject and object self and world it is all one totality and so 5meo dmt is just a very extremely unique energetic key that unlocks this potential within the human vehicle within the human body and it it has the potential to override the ego in a way that other psychedelics generally don't like you know sometimes you talk to people who work a lot with ayahuasca or something like that or psilocybin mushrooms and they might say well out of my six hour experience i had like a three second glimpse of like there was this unity and then i fell back down out of it and that's because the human ego is incredibly resilient it always wants to rebuild itself and it needs an excuse to to really let go and surrender and that's just what makes 5meo so uniquely powerful and significant that nothing really compares so, to it there really isn't and so many <clears throat> so many studies being done i have so many questions i mean stanford's doing these huge studies with 5meo and aboga that are just they're life changing for a lot of these veterans and i mean <clears throat> The experience that you experience on these medicines, that DMT release, almost like we explain it as a death, I think is such, it's so hard. It almost, that non-duality, like you explain it, I understand it, but for the real world, they think, well, so we believe we're, you're all just an illusion, but, you know, are we? <laughs> you know, are we? What are we? Yeah. So, well, What is non-duality in general? Yeah. So... First, I think we need to recognize that there's lots of different flavors of non-duality, that non-duality is certainly not a new concept. It's been around for a long time, and it's shown up in various cultures across the world, and it's been articulated through different religious and spiritual traditions. And what I find most limiting about that is that the prior articulations of non-duality were still wrapped up in religious metaphysics and doctrine, which from my own non-dual perspective, I just fundamentally disagree with. So when I talk about non-duality, I kind of use this phrase of radical non-duality, um, and I don't tie it to any particular tradition. But historically speaking, you know, within Hinduism, there is the uh, Vedantan school of Advaita Vedanta, which means the non-dual Vedantan school. Buddhism also has traditionally kind of been characterized as a non-dual um, religious or spiritual tradition. Um, but both of them have elements that I would identify as thoroughly dualistic and not really compatible with what I would call radical non-duality. So my formulation of radical non-duality is that there is literally only one being and consciousness that exists. There's only one. And that's what I call God. And this being and consciousness is made out of energy. Now, the most fundamental frequency of this energy is unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And so this being, this infinite being and infinite energy and infinite consciousness is, and here's another place where I really disagree with traditional non-duality, where both Buddhism and Hinduism pretty much say that the physical world is all an illusion and um, that this is all just some kind of, it's called Maya within those traditions. They say, well, it's just, it's not real, that your individuality is not real. And here I fundamentally disagree that my formulation is that this being actually is what we call physical reality. When we look around and we see, okay, over there, there's some trees outside my window. Those right. trees are this universal consciousness in the form of those trees. So those trees are absolutely real. They exist. They, they are a coherent energy structure within reality in the same way that my physical body is a coherent and consistent energetic structure within reality. And so I am a vehicle for this one universal consciousness to experience and express itself through. 
Most of the time that's hidden by the ego because the ego develops and we say, oh, well, I'm Martin and you're Mark and we're different from each other. And we are, we are different characters. We are in different bodies, but the consciousness that makes me, me and makes you, you actually is identical at core. And so the, the differences that we perceive is actually just a surface phenomenon um, and that we are all this one being interacting with itself through these different forms of energy and energetic structures. And I do always insist that the ontology of the physical world is fundamentally different from the ontology of dreams, from the ontology of visions, that I do not like to refer to the physical world as an illusion. I do not like to refer to individual identity as an illusion. It's our attachment to the individuality, that's the illusion. And then also the way that we project onto reality and how we make meaning out of reality. That is all a function of the ego. The ego makes meaning. So religion, spirituality, metaphysics, politics, um, expressions of identity, these are where we're getting into illusions, that the physical world is not an illusion in any way, shape, or form. It's as real as anything gets, but it is all God performing as these various objects and various subjects within reality. So I totally get that so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. That's, yeah, that's deep, but it's so profoundly true. If you have not only been on some of these experiences, but I don't think you need plant medicines a lot of times to some maybe feel these and get these. I think they can be experienced in a lot of different ways. And that's pretty deep stuff right there. Yeah, it's true that there are a lot of pathways to the non-dual experience. And I do like mm -hmm. to say that this is not, even though it's the most special experience you could ever have, it's actually not special because it's just the foundation of reality. It's just how things are, that there's nothing fundamentally supernatural about this in any way, shape, or form. And so in that sense, this level of awareness is fundamentally available in any moment and in any situation because it is not somewhere else. We don't have to go to it. All we need to do is relax into it because it's already present. And so like sometimes people talk about how I want to um, unite with God or I want I want to unite with everything. And that's actually only a statement that an ego would make because the ego is then projecting, well, God is something other than me and I want to unite with it and so that I can have this experience. But those are all just the egoic identity. And it all goes back to the attachments, though. It all goes back yeah. to attaching to something if you really get to that deeper level. And if, I mean, but all these plant medicine journeys, I, I mean, not as so far as deep as the 5-MEO, but all of them circumvent to the same conditional thing, unconditional love, God, and energy. I mean, I, I truly believe, because I only can believe what I believe. I think God, after so many of these medicine journeys, I think God is us. And I think when I feel that, and it's come down to that understanding, that that's where that energy compounds from, you know? Yeah. So yeah. God is me. God's yes. you. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's not an egoic statement. That is not a statement of personal identity. Oh, say, absolutely not. It's not but not. Yes, I see that. But the 3D world and this... Our Western world perceives that as you're not God, because yeah. that's the attachment they're making to God. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And what I really love about 5-MeO DMT is that one of the things that I hear most often from people who get to have this experience, and also, again, recognizing that not everyone has this experience right away. Sometimes it takes a while to get there, and some people mm -hmm. can resist it all the way through, so they might never have this full experience. But for those who do, the general commentary coming out is that, oh my God, I'm God. And that is so obvious. It was the most, when I, when I had these experience, it was just like, of course, it's always been this way. And actually I've, I've fundamentally always known this. I just wasn't admitting to myself or accepting within myself that this was the truth. So it just presents as something so fundamentally obvious that there really isn't any argument around the matter. That it's just like, it's reality presents itself as one unified being in consciousness and you've always been it. You've just been pretending to only be the person that you are. So I always like because to say but that. I think religion has taught us that though. Yes. religion's aspect has taught us that god is this person or this person that 
is God really a person? And it's not egoic at all. It's just like, God, God's yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, religion, religions have been misleading and scientific misleading. materialism has also been misleading. I, you know, I tend more towards the scientific materialist view than I do to any religious or spiritual view. But what's mm -hmm. lacking is that scientific materialism or humanism says you are just a human being. And here's why I say, yes, we are, we are both a human being and we are God, we are, we are God. the universal are the consciousness. Human. So we actually reside in sort of this paradoxical state that we are both the individual that we are, that is fundamentally true and real, and we are a human being, but we are also this universal consciousness. And what I think most psychedelic experiences reveal, because they are res residing within the realm of duality, is that via the alteration of consciousness through these molecular tools, we are able to enter into, into what I like to call the divine imagination. And that's where we get all this content from of fantastic temples and architecture and art and beings and creatures and realms that all of that I characterize as the divine imagination. It's not a quote unquote real space. It's a projection space. It's a right. virtual space where we encounter ourselves as God in these different mm -hmm. forms of maybe as a spirit guide, or maybe as a, you know, a sacred place, or maybe as a demon, you know, the, the variety is endless, but we're still mm -hmm. processing that through a perspective where it says, wow, I am encountering my spirit guide in this visionary space. So that's still within the realm of duality. It's still separating subject and object. And when we go beyond that, that's when we realize, oh, it's all one. There is no subject and object here. It's actually one all-encompassing thingness, beingness. You know, you explain this almost so well. It's like almost being there in that experience. But you've been, you touched on a subject that a lot of us aren't familiar with, and I'm going to get off 5MEO for a minute, but it's salvia. You've mentioned it a couple times. Yeah. And what is it about salvia that's, you know, I've never done it, but I've heard many great things about it, or I've heard things about it. I just shouldn't say great, <laughs> yeah. good, or bad. I've just heard things that it's a really powerful experience. What is it? What is salvia? And what is it? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about salvia. I was definitely um, a salvia enthusiast for a number of years. And it's not that that enthusiasm has changed. I just haven't had much experience with it um, over really ever since encountering 5-MEO because that really that really took the cake for me. But anyway, salvia uh, more properly would be a salvia divinorum. And so this is a form of sage plant. It's part of the sage family. And it is the only sage plant in the world that has psychedelic properties. And the active uh, molecule there was identified by Daniel Siebert quite some time ago. And that's salvinorin A. And what is very interesting about salvinorin A is that, you know, it doesn't belong to any other class of psychedelic molecules. So, you know, we have tryptamines which would be ayahuasca, mushrooms, DMT, 5-MeO, you know, there's a whole variety of tryptamines, also iboga. And then we have phenethylamines, such as uh, peyote, San Pedro, MDMA, uh, 2CB, those are in the phenethylamine family. But salvinorne is not related to any of these, so it's a very unique molecule. And it works on different receptor sites within the brain. They actually work on the opioid receptor sites um, and not the serotonin receptor sites, which these other molecules tend to react on, uh, is my understanding. I should say I'm not a neuroscientist, so, you know, um, this is just my understanding. But anyway, um, salvia divinorum has been used uh, for a very, very, very long time by the Mazatec culture in Mexico. And in fact, they've been using salvia for so long that all the salvia that exists on the planet at this time is actually one plant. So in other words, they've been cultivating it for so long that it's lost the ability to flower and go to seed. And so the way that it has been propagated for, we don't even know how long now, is that you take a cutting of a salvia plant and then you put it in the ground and then it grows into a new salvia plant. Then you take a cutting and then it, you put it in the ground and it grows into a new salvia plant. So it's so actually, no seedlings. So yeah. No seeds. So it's all genetically, it's the same plant. It's one mm -hmm. plant that is just repopulating again and again and again. And the way that I was introduced to it uh, was through Daniel Siebert. Um, and what he 
does is he it extracts salvinorin A from the leaves and then he adds it back to the leaves so that you get a higher concentration. And that makes it um, very easy to access the experience through smoking. So traditionally in Mazatec culture, you would take like 13 of these long sage leaves and kind of roll them up into a big cigar and then you chew on it. And the salvinorne is um, absorbed through your mouth and it's kind of a longer and slower experience that way, but it's very bitter. Um, but here, by adding salvinorne back onto the leaves and upping the concentration, you're able to smoke just a very small amount. And what I like to say about salvia is when, when you really have a powerful salvia experience, what happens is uh, reality unzips and mm -hmm. then it turns inside out a few times and then it gets smeared across multiple dimensions simultaneously and then eventually kind of flips back around, zips back up and plops you back down where you started. And wow. It's, <laughs> That's it's, a cartoon in itself. <laughs> oh, it totally is. It's like the most oh cartoonish God. of all the psychedelics. And it's it's so bizarre that honestly, most people who are into psychedelic experience that they encounter Salvinorin A and they're like, I don't know what the hell that was. That was really freaky. That was totally bizarre. I don't know what to make of it. So actually, most people who try it say, I'm never doing that again. But I was one of these people that when I first tried it, I was just, I was completely enamored with it because it was like tripping really hard on mushrooms, but just within the span of like 15 minutes. And it just, it blew my mind that I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And that was kind of my standard for, oh, you're giving me something to smoke that's supposed to immediately launch me into this radical psychedelic experience. And, and that's why my first couple forays into 5-MeO DMT, which was well below the threshold dose, were completely unimpressive because I was like, salvia is so much more interesting than this. But then once I Was there I healing had... properties to it? Was there healing benefits at all, would you say, Martin, with the um, salvia? It's it's honestly it's a bit trickier there because it is so yeah. strange. It is mm -hmm. so bizarre that most people kind of come out of it with like, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know right. what might be healing about that. But what I have identified as really being significant about salvia, and this is my own personal take on it, is that all of all of these different molecules, all these different psychedelic molecules, they all mm -hmm. alter and amplify our energy in different unique ways. So each psychedelic molecule has its own kind of energetic spectrum and signature. And salvia divinorum is fundamentally unique. So for example, 5-MeO-DMT vibrates at a super fast rate. It's a very, very high vibration, very super fine. In contrast, salvia divinorum is like this, you know, it's this really slow wave. It's not super fast. So it's actually on the other end of the spectrum from 5-MeO-DMT. And mm. what I like to say is the value of that is that we fundamentally are beings of energy. You know, sometimes people have sort of this outdated Star Trek notion that a being of pure energy is just going to be this amorphous blob floating around in space. But that's yep. not what a being of energy is. We are beings of energy. And so anything that gives us access to a unique presentation and experience of our own energy is valuable in and of itself. And so salvia serves that role that it gets us the opposite end of the spectrum from 5-MeO DMT with this very different energetic presentation. And what happened with me with salvia is that it really served as a vehicle for kind of tuning into different kinds of vibrations. And I actually, through my salvia experiences that I would say it, but I do mean me, uh, it taught me how to throat and overtone sing. And, you know, it was just, I would feel these energies inside me and they, they just had to come out. And so it was a way of teaching me how to express myself energetically that was not tied to the egoic structures of language that allowed me to experience and feel myself in a very different way. And that actually laid the foundation for a lot of things that then developed later with my experiences with 5-MeO-DMT. I didn't understand it at the time, but I now see it as very foundational to how I was able to develop further uh, using these other psychedelic medicines. So I think it's extremely powerful in those respects. And 
you know, within traditional Mazatec culture, they also use psilocybin mushrooms. And mm -hmm. according to the anthropology that I've read, um, the preference within Mazatec culture is for psilocybin mushrooms and that salvia was just used when the mushrooms were not available. So it was considered somewhat secondary to the psilocybin in terms of healing potential. Um, but it's just, it's an extremely powerful, powerful experience. And I, you know, sometimes I kind of joke around and I do say, well, any self-respecting medicine person um, really should give themselves the opportunity to experience salvia because it's so fundamentally different. It's just unlike any other psychedelic, you're not going to find a comparison to anything else. Well, great. That's a great, great explanation on that. And music. We're talking about energies a lot. You have a yeah. great playlist on music I listened to the other day. It was really, really, really entertaining for my mind. So you think music portrays a lot in these journeys. And I think for me, it brings out sometimes some entities, I guess, if I can say. Music will really have a desire to do that. And, you know... <clears throat> Music and these entities, and when you see these entities, we all experience these on some of these journeys, um, especially on these DMT journeys. What do you think that is? What, what do you think that entity vision, that something else that's there, actually there, and our brain has never seen that before, but we've seen that. So what is that? Yeah. So entities uh, can only appear if the ego is present. If the ego is not present, there will be no entities. So wow. what I always like really? to say is that the Is that on every medicine journey or that is that just in general? Well, that's more of a general statement. It's it's not mm -hmm. it's not a determination. It's not to say if you are it, perceiving through your ego that you will see entities. It's just saying that if you are experiencing entities, you are by definition experiencing this phenomenon through the construct of your ego so yeah. that entity appearances are always related to some form of egoic identity because look if we say i saw that that's an egoic statement can i that, say can I, let me interrupt there though that's very interesting you say that because that makes a lot of sense but why explaining that are very hard some of these psychedelic journeys but explaining these journeys those entities look very similar to a lot of people and they're even drawn in that similar fashion. Yeah, well, this is where, you know, I use this explanatory model of the divine imagination, that there are constructs within the divine imagination, and we are all sharing. I mean, we have to remember again, we are all one consciousness. So in theory, there is nothing that is actually completely private within anyone's experience of consciousness. So that we, you know... I don't really like to use these terms, but we can maybe use the term like Carl Jung and the collective unconscious and these these theories of archetypes that there are aspects of consciousness that we can all tap into, but it's the divine imagination. So it's not personalized, but when we experience these, these things, we're always experiencing it through some form of personalized identity. So, so some form of egoic construct. So I like to say that the ego doesn't just construct your sense of self. It's always also simultaneously you're constructing your sense of what is not you, what is exterior to you. So it, the ego actually resides on the surface in the sense that it creates the depth of me on this side and it creates the depth of not me on this side. So it's creating self and world simultaneously. It's a seamless experience. So I'll give you an example. Back when I used to facilitate 5-MeO DMT experiences for people. I would um, have my clients positioned right in front of me and often they would sit up and you can actually see on their face that they're trying to understand who and what they are and they're looking at me and then there's different expressions that would come on their face and I could say, okay, they're trying to relate to me. And they would tell me later, well, I was looking at you, but you weren't you. You were like this weird alien insect person, or I was looking at you, but you were my mother, or I was looking at you, but you were me. And that's literally what I mean by projection, that the ego is trying to project, who is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. So when we kind of loosen the bounds of the egoic construct and we disrupt the default mode network and we go into these visionary spaces of the divine imagination, there's still aspects of the ego that's asking, what's that? Who is that? Where am I? And so people see these entities and beings. But I always challenge people. I always say, look, 
if you think that this entity actually exists, go ahead and ask it, who are you? And the answer is always the same. If people actually ask the question of any of these entities, the answer is always, I am you. Across the board, that's uh, what these that's entities true. answer because that's true. the truth. They true. are just forms of ourselves that we're interacting with that we haven't recognized as ourselves. So I do like to refer to the divine imagination as something of an interactive projected mirror. So everything we're seeing is actually a mirror reflection of ourselves. But if we don't recognize ourselves and we say, oh, whoa, what's that? Who is that? And then these entities form. And some of them can be light. Some of them can be dark. Some of them can be playful. Some of them can be absurd. Some of them can just be bizarre and trippy and just completely alien. But they're all the self trying to make sense of who am I? What am I? What am I experiencing? now and that's where there's always the potential to go beyond that into the non-dual experience and then this sense of beings and entities completely dissolves and you go into oh yeah it's me obviously it's <laughs> all of it's me it's always been me yeah. Yeah. this is just me and then you fall Absolutely. back down out of that and then you're interacting with entities again but what i do like to say about these entities is that they only exist in the moment that they are perceived and experienced whereas with you and I, we have physical bodies. When you and I walk away from this interview, you are not going to disappear and I am not going to disappear because we have physical bodies that have coherent and consistent energetic structures that exist in space and time. These visionary entities do not have that. They only exist in the moment of their being perceived and experienced. So they're a temporary projection within divine consciousness with which we are perceiving through some form of egoic structure within ourselves, even if it's an altered egoic structure, even if it's, I don't know who I am, but I'm out in the universe and look, there's aliens and look, there's a space station. I still don't know who I am. So it doesn't have to be the personalized egoic identity, but it's still an individual perspective, which is viewing this and saying, there's something separate between myself and what I'm perceiving. There's still a subject object divide that's taking place here. Therefore I am perceiving this, but and another one that I like to, okay, so I'll just, I'll briefly tell you the story of, uh, I was on a whole variety of things. Um, I think I was on MDMA with some 4ACO, DMT, and some MXD. Uh, this is one of my cocktails. And I, I, I see myself in this vast hall. It's just this enormous architectural structure and it's all made out of pure crystalline rainbow light and along this hall there are these alcoves and in each alcove there is kind of like a suit of armor but it's all made out of crystals and it's made out of this rainbow light and in in my experience in my perspective i'm walking through the hall and i'm going to each one of these suits of armor and each one is different and unique and just incredibly detailed and the the face is down and then as I stand in front of it, the face looks up and looks right at me and says, it's me. And then it smiled and then the head goes back down. And so I went to each one in the hall and each one said, it's me, it's me. And then the whole hall started to break down at the binocular level where each atom is like breaking apart. And as they're breaking apart, they're all screaming, it's me, it's me. And then it all just broke into this echoing, it's me, it's me. And then it's like, of course, it's all me that's all that there is the only thing you ever encounter is yourself that's yeah. it so cool i mean you can bring people if you've been doing the medicine you can bring people into the medicine just how you talk you know it's really cool how you can do this um you know everything's all this whole psychedelic movement revolution however you want to see it is really really moving along where do you see it all going especially with psilocybin and 5-meo and all these phenomenal fascinating medicines that really we feel are here to heal your mental health where do you yeah. see all these going well i think that we are kind of past the breaking point um with where we are right now you know as we've already mentioned that i kind of started with my book mushroom wisdom back in 2006 and at, at that point in time it was like you know, I don't know if we'll ever see 
legal ac access to psychedelics, but this is what we're, we're rooting for because humanity could really use this in a profound way. Mm -hmm. And we have a fundamental human right to access these things. I mean, no one has a right to tell us you can't explore your own being. I mean, True. who gives anyone that authority? Um, and things have just really escalated um, to the point where now, um, just last week, Australia, the, the entire country legalized psilocybin and MDMA uh, assisted therapy within the country. Is that out of nowhere? Is that out of nowhere for a country that was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Strapped up in COVID with masks and everything. And here they go and say, okay, psychedelics are the new thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it completely surprised everyone. But see, we're really, at, we're really at the breaking point because there's been enough preliminary scientific research done that we're well beyond the point that anyone can rationally argue that these things are not safe and effective. You know, that there are still going to be some drug warriors out there who's like, no, it's a drug, therefore it's inherently bad. But if you look at the science, if you look at what's actually been studied, that we know that that's not true, that right. it's demonstrable. These things, they're not addictive. They have a lot of benefits. They can definitely be used in therapeutic uh, circumstances. So that's like one edge is like the therapy front. Um, I think another big front is with entheogenic churches where um, people are just, they're forming their entheogenic churches and they're saying, look, we want to use these things as a sacrament and this is our religious right. And there's definitely right. been precedent for that with the Native American church, the Union del Vegetal, and the Santo Daime church. Mm -hmm. um, but those are all established religions. What's happening now is people are just making their own religions. They're making their own churches. And um, that's a huge front, which is uh, just blossoming in the United States right now. Absolutely. Another aspect um, that we're seeing a lot of change is in the decriminalization movement, which is not necessarily looking to create legal marketplaces or legal therapy, but it's saying we just, at the very least, we need to decriminalize these things. We should, we need to stop putting people in prison for using these things. And right. we're not going to make it a police priority. So we have a variety of different fronts that just in the past couple of years, there's been a, just an astounding amount of progress made in this area. And so I think that we are eventually heading towards all of these things being decriminalized. Uh, I think if, if there's going to be any legitimacy to the process, they have to be rescheduled. They have to be taken out of Schedule 1, which is right. um, it, a Schedule 1 drug has to be addictive. None of these things are addictive. They have yeah. to have um, detrimental health impacts. They do not. And they yeah. have to have no medical uses, which they clearly all do. And Absolutely. then in terms of just our basic human rights to explore our own consciousness and being in the way that we choose that's right. a, that's that's a no-brainer there's no argument against that and mm -hmm. as for a religious and spiritual freedom that's another one there is no rational argument against that and mm -hmm. so we essentially those of us in this side of the psychedelic movement all the facts are on our side. Reality is 100% on our side. And Absolutely. reality is going to win. Reality and always wins in the end. And, you know, I think education is going to win, too. I think if we educate the Western world, and I truly am a firm believer that psilocybin will be the Western world medicine, I think the big three, aboga, 5-MeO, and ayahuasca are reserved for some of the reserve. But I really think psilocybin is going to be the main stake of mental health 2030. So look at yeah. that way. Yeah, I think that it's going to have a huge impact. And hopefully that opens the doors um, to other, you know, I'd like to see it open the door for um, other forms of psilocybin and other forms of tryptamine that, you know, like here in Oregon, we've legalized psilocybin assisted therapy. But um, within that, one of the regulations is that you can only use the mushroom fruiting bodies themselves. In other words, you can't make an extract of psilocybin and then use that in a therapeutic setting. And, you know, I do love mushrooms, but I'm also someone who gets a lot of intestinal discomfort and gas right. from mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of other people out there like that as well. So this idea that you must use the mushroom, it's like, look, we can just synthesize psilocybin or we can extract psilocybin 
Um, we could also use 4-ACO DMT, which actually converts into psilocin once it's consumed within the body. And then you're not getting all that gastrointestinal stuff. And I know some people want to argue that, oh, that's an important part of the experience. I would just disagree with that, that having physical discomfort is not necessarily a boon to any kind of therapeutic process, that we do want things to be as, as easy as possible. So I think that psilocybin is a great entry point, um, mm -hmm. but I'd like it to open up to more possibilities as well. And also, I do not want to see it confined to you're stuck in a room for five hours, you have to lie down with a blind shade on, you've got two people watching over you, that I think that that is an incredibly limited form of therapeutic application. Um, I think it's a good entry point, but if yeah. things were just to stop there, this is kind of the standard MAPS model. I think it's extraordinarily limited. Um, yeah. And so it, we need to have a lot more diversity there in terms of what we're talking about, what constitutes therapy and a therapeutic process. And finally, why don't we talk about the one of our most important subjects is what do you feel about integration? Where does integration lie with you with these medicines? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And this is another thing that I like to point out that when I kind of started in this field, this wasn't even a word that anybody used. There was there was no talk of integration. Like, you know, my I was one of the really kind of early pioneers with 5-MeO-DMT that it was not well known when I first started uh, working with it. And in fact, almost nobody had ever heard of it. And they wouldn't believe me when I told them, like, this is the God molecule. This is the top of the line. This, this is the ultimate experience. People are like, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, DMT and ayahuasca. I was like, no, no, this is so far beyond that. But anyway... People ask me, like, what did you do for integration back in 2008 when you were having these experiences? And I answered, like, like nobody even talked about it then. Like, it wasn't right. even a thing. And plus, at that point in time, virtually no one had ever had 5-MeO-DMT. So there was no one to talk to about my experiences because nobody knew about it. Mm -hmm. um, but now integration, we can see, is a very important aspect of working with these medicines. And... Here, it's really different for every person. Not everyone needs as much integration reflection as other people, but this is now something that I do. I offer my services in 30, 60, or 90 minute video calls with people. Mm -hmm. And usually what we do, so here's, this is my version of the integration. Someone's coming to me and they've had a really powerful psychedelic experience and maybe they're discombobulated, maybe they're confused, maybe they just they just want to talk to someone about it. Usually what we do is I start by kind of getting, well, what's your personal story? Where do you come from? How were you raised? Let me get some idea of, of your background and any kind of formative or traumatic experiences that you've had and not everybody has trauma, you know, but everybody has issues and in coming into being and coming into awareness. Um, so then we, we get that background and then um, I ask them about any major life changes that they've had, such as leaving or joining a religion, um, leaving or joining a family or, you know, culture or identity and see where they have identified themselves. And then we get into, okay, so when you heard about this medicine that you're coming to me to talk about, um, what made you say, yes, I want to do that and get into what's their motivation there? What were you looking for? And then what we'll do is we'll, I like to walk through people's experience from moment to moment as much as they can recall. And I ask them lots of questions about, well, what was your body doing? What sounds were you making? Um, you know, where were you looking? You know, even, even things like that, it become very important. And then that gives me a nice well-rounded picture of who this person is, what kind of energy, energetic patterns they're bringing into the medicine experience. And then we see what were the challenges? What arose for you? Where were, the, where were the breakthroughs? And kind of give them an energetic diagnostic of like, okay, so this is what we can understand is going on with you now. This is why you're getting these after effects that these processes have now been initiated. So these are things that you're now working on and really right. providing a contextual perspective through this energetic lens. For me, that's what integration is. And also looking for calling people out. Let's say, okay, so that was a projection. Okay, that was an attachment. You see, you were just bullshitting yourself on that one. And helping people arrive at a place of clarity so that they can have a rational, personal understanding of what they Like an awareness, doing. just an yeah. awareness of yourself. Yeah, a total yeah. awareness. It's so just... Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, for me, that really is what integration is. Now, some people talk about integration and say, 
integration is going to get a massage and meditating or taking walks in nature. And I think that all those things are great, but I don't see them as integration. I see those just as practices that that's not going to make you integrate. And then some people also say that important part of integration is sharing your story in a group. And that's also a place where I have a lot of concerns because when people get together in groups, there's a lot of egoic identification and projection that's mm -hmm. going on. And if people themselves are not coming from a place of clarity, mm -hmm. then they can inject their own egoic interpretation. So for example, sometimes I have people come to me and they say, well, based on my shaman's understanding or based on my support group's understanding, I've been possessed by an entity and I need an exorcism. And usually I can unpack that for them and show them, that's not at all what's going on here. You you just have people trying to convince you of that because they don't understand the nature of your energetic experience. But actually, this is all you just trying to break out of the confines that you have constructed for yourself. So I do think it's important about who you are sharing your experiences with and whose interpretations you're relying upon. So I think it's it's an area that needs a lot more discussion and a lot more unpacking. I think it absolutely does too. And I think this field is broadening with these psychedelic integration coaches. I think to be any kind of coach or therapist in this field, that you have to have some of these experiences. That's just absolutely. my true belief. And, absolutely. you know, I see the future of these medicines, maybe the Mark Zuckerberg um, uh, metaverse, kind of like where you're at, put these glasses on, bring people back to that um, visual state or where they were at and maybe go through that therapy then or go through that working through that framework then, but I can see that as a very future of this medicine, maybe bringing people back to that state of consciousness where you were at under that medicine with this new technology. That's just my vision. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but it'd be really cool to see that work. Yeah, I think that there's just so much room for creativity. Like you, you mentioned music earlier and the importance of music within psychedelic sessions and the importance of the environment and the, and the importance of who you're taking it with. You know, all of these, everything is energy. So what energies are we bringing into the space? And some people are very uncomfortable with technology or they don't want, um, you know, music played uh, from a digital source. They want to have like live musicians and then some people, everything wants to be organic and don't talk to me about synthetic. But I think that those are just our, our human egoic biases. And I think that if, if certain people find that putting on a VR headset allows them to go deeper into their experience or helps to re-enter that state later because it has various um, positive triggers that can help you regain that state of consciousness, I'm all for it, that I am... I am someone who I'm very creative and expressive myself, and I want to encourage that and others that I think creativity um, is potentially quite infinite here. And I think the combination of technology, of music, of biofeedback, um, of you know whatever whatever people want to bring into the space. That for me, it's not that you've got to be out in nature and only you know somebody rattling or with a drum you know because we want to keep it all natural i think that that is its own particular hang up of the ego and you see a lot of it in psychedelic communities where absolutely people are you know they're like i only want what's natural but the whole natural versus artificial is just a human construct like because again going back to it's all god it doesn't matter what you're talking about whether it's made in a lab or made in a toad it's all god and there's nothing that's more god than anything else it's all equal profoundly oh easy. god yeah well we'll end there because that was a i could talk to you for a long time and it would get really boring to a lot of people so um let's end there great conversation today glad we got in touch hopefully become friends and continue to educate these people on these beautiful medicines and i just want to reach out and sell to some of our sponsors solvine great aya product that they have and mama dose our daily dose of Mother Earth. Great having you today, Martin. We'll be in touch again. Great right. conversation. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.